Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I wish to extend a warm welcome to you for the fourth Asia Pacific Forum of The Hague. I'm an, I am Hyun Sun Kim of the ICC. It is a truly great honor for me to be a master of today's event. We are very happy to host the event today as we mark the 20th year anniversary of the ICC. The event is co-hosted by the International Criminal Court and the Hague Project Peace and Justice with the financial support of the European Commission. Before we begin, I'd like to kindly remind of the following. The seminar will consist of two sessions. Session one, recent developments at the International Criminal Court. Session two, a career in international criminal justice. Each session will be followed by a Q&A session, and the whole event will be recorded. It will be uploaded on the ICC YouTube channel, and the event will be in English, and no interpretation will be available. Participants are welcome to post questions. This event aims to address any questions relevant to the topic. The Q&A time is prepared at the end of each session. Now, I'd like to open the main event with the opening remarks. I have the honor to invite President of the International Criminal Court, Judge Peter Hovmansky, for his opening remarks. President Hovmansky, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a great pleasure for me to, to welcome you on the Fourth Asia Pacific Forum uh, on the International Criminal Court. Uh, I would like to thank the Hague Peace and Justice Project for co-hosting this uh, event with the ICC, as well as the European Commission for the financial uh, support to make uh, this uh, webinar possible. The Asia Pacific Forum started in 2018 with the goal to facilitate an open dialogue about the Asia Pacific region engagement with the um, uh, ICC system. Uh, I am very happy that it has become an annual tradition. Uh, before I, I go further, I should explain what we mean by the Asia Pacific region in the context of the ICC. By this name, we are referring to the to a division of all of the world's countries uh, into five groups for the purpose of ensuring geographical balance and staffing in elections for top position and so forth. The system was created in the United Nations and is also applied in the International Criminal Court. With this system, the Asia Pacific is one of the largest and most diverse group as it spans from the Mediterranean Sea into the West and all the way to the middle of the Pacific Ocean, the East covering almost the whole globe. This includes Western Asia, Central Asia, South Asia, East Asia, Southern Asia, and Pacific Islands. One of the main reasons why we decided to devote a special webinar for the Asia Pacific is that it is unfortunately the least represented region in the ICC system in terms of the percentage of states that have ratified the Rome Statute since the finding treaty of the ICC, as well as, as in terms of, uh, of staff at the ICC. We believe that the dialogue is a key to addressing these two issues. Ladies and gentlemen, the historical contribution of the Asia Pacific region to international criminal justice has been significant. 
some of the ICC's institutional predecessors were located in the Asia Pacific. This includes the International Military Tribunal for the Far East, which was set up in Tokyo in the aftermatch of the horrors of the Second World War. More uh, recent examples are the extraordinary chambers uh, of the courts of Cambodia, uh, the special panels in the Dili District Court in Timor Leste, and the special tribunal for Lebanon, which uh, all form an important part of the development of international criminal justice in the last three decades. Countries of the Asia-Pacific region also played an active part in the negotiation of the Rome Statute and made very important contribution to the drafting process. The Asia-Pacific group of states has furthermore produced many top officials to the ICC. Our court had judges from Japan, the Republic of Korea, the Philippines, Cyprus, and Samoa. Among them, Judge Sang Hyun Song, of Korea served for six years as president of the court. Zaid bin Riyad al Hussein of Jordan and the Ogun Khan of Korea have served as presidents of the ICC and Assembly of State Parties. And Mr. Motu Noguchi of Japan served two terms as the chair of the board of the ICC's trust fund for victims. Currently, two judges from the Asia Pacific serving at the ICC are my dear uh, colleagues, Judge Chang Ho Chung of Korea and Judge Tomoka Kana of Japan. I am delighted that Judge Chung will address you in the first panel um, today. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm, as I already um, indicated, the Asia Pacific is the most underrepresented group of states in the ICC system, which uh, with only 19 of the more than 50 countries in the region being party to the Rome Statute. This is regrettable for several reasons. First of all, it means that hundreds of millions of people do not enjoy the legal, pro legal protection of the Rome Statute against the worst atrocity crimes. If the national authorities in their countries do not take action against the perpetrators of crimes against humanity and other atrocities, there is no international system to fall back on to give the victims access to justice. This also means that there is less deterrent effect to help prevent such crimes from happening. Secondly, many states in the Asia and the Pacific are not able to contribute fully with the legal cultures to our global institution. For instance, the nationals of states that have not joined the Rome Statute cannot become judges in the ICC. For all these reasons, we want to raise awareness of the ICC's mandate in the Asia-Pacific region and dispel myths and misconceptions that may exist. As tomorrow leaders, you have an important role to play in this mission. I hope this webinar will inspire you to consider applying for a job or an internship at the ICC. The more people from the Asia Pacific region come to work with us, the more it will help spread understanding of the ICC. As young professionals, you can be advocates for the more active participation of you countries in the international criminal justice system. In a globalized world, all countries should work together for peace, security, the rule of law, and the protection of human rights. The ICC is an essential part of those efforts. The ICC belongs to the countries and the people in Asia and the Pacific just as much as it belongs to any other part of the world. Ladies and gentlemen, dear students, we 
as we celebrate the ICC's 20th anniversary this year, we can confidentially say that the ICC is here to stay. The court has overcome numerous challenges and achieved much more in two decades than many thought possible. A record number of five cases is on trial this year. The ICC is investigating alleged crimes in 16 countries on four different continents, including Asia, Europe, Africa, and South America. The ICC's trust power for victims has provided reparations and assistance to several hundred thousands of victims and family members. Unfortunately, the demand of the court mandate remains high. We are motivated every day by knowing how important our job is to humanity. I hope some of you will join that mission in the future. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, President Hofmanski, for your inspiring speech. This brings us to the session one of the event, the recent developments at the International Criminal Court. Before we begin, we'd like to invite you to watch a short video on the introduction of the ICC. Now let's watch the video. The International Criminal Court is the first and the only permanent international criminal court to try those accused of the gravest of crimes, genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and the crime of aggression. It is located in The Hague in the Netherlands. The ICC was established in 1998. It was a historic step reflecting the determination of the world to prevent the gravest of crimes and bring to justice those who have committed those crimes. The founding states signed a treaty, the Rome Statute. This established the International Criminal Court. Today, there are 123 states parties. The states parties provide funding for the court. They elect the judges, the prosecutor, and the deputy prosecutors, and oversee the way the court is managed. The ICC is a court of last resort. This means that it does not replace national courts and justice systems. It can prosecute individuals only if a state is unable or unwilling to genuinely investigate and prosecute crimes. The court has no police force or army, so it relies on the cooperation of states for arresting those accused of crimes. For fair decisions to be reached, the court follows clear legal processes. The court has 18 judges. They conduct proceedings in the courtroom. It is their job to ensure that trials are fair. Following a trial, judges decide whether an accused person is guilty or innocent. The Office of the Prosecutor investigates crimes and prosecutes individuals. It does not prosecute states. No one is exempt from prosecution because of their status or position. Amnesty cannot be used to avoid prosecution. During trials, accused people are presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. They are afforded a number of rights to ensure that proceedings are fair. Victims have the right to participate in the proceedings, most likely through a lawyer who will represent them in court. They can request reparations if the accused is found guilty and convicted. The ICC will continue to work with states parties, civil society, and communities to help prevent mass crimes. Together, we can build a more just world. Now, let us kick off with session one. For session one, I have the honor and privilege to introduce session speaker, ICC Judge Tang Ho Chang. His Excellency Judge Chang Ho Chang from the Republic of Korea, he was elected as an ICC judge in 2015 for a term of nine years. Prior to the ICC, Judge Chang served as a UN judge in the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia. Before that, 
Church Chung served in several positions as a judge in the Republic of Korea. Now, let us invite Church Chung to the floor. Church Chung, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Chan-san. And I also thank you very much, President Hofmanski, for your uh, insight into the ICC and your kind encouragement for the students and young lawyers of Asian Pacific region. <clears throat> I also appreciate all the participants today for your support and interest in the International Criminal Court and International Criminal Law. As mentioned by President, Asian Pacific region is underrepresented in terms of not only the number of member states, but also number of court staff. However, I'm confident that in the near future, students and young lawyers from Asian Pacific region may have more opportunity to work for the ICC. And for this, uh, you need to have precise understanding of the ICC functions and ICC jurisprudence. So by, uh, through my lecture today, by introducing recent development at the, at the ICC, I will help you study and ca catch up uh, the whole those ICC functions and ICC jurisprudence in a most efficient way. And, and my, my present presentation file, is, would you please display? Yes, next, next slide, please. Uh, as mentioned in the video, ICC is a treaty body. And the Rome Statute is the finding, founding treaty of the ICC. So the first thing you have to do is to be familiar with all the articles in the Rome Statute, all the articles themselves in the Rome Statute. I strongly recommend you to almost memorize all the articles regarding charges, crimes, uh, investigation, and trials, trials. That should be the first step for you to study the ICC. Next slide, please. And the Rome Statutes emphasize the codification. So Article 21.1a expressly provide these written statement, written statute, Rome Statute, elements of crimes, rules of procedure and evidence as the primary applicable law. And Article 22 emphasized the criminal principle of no crime without law, and 23, no penalty without law. So especially when it comes to definition of a crime, justice should be very careful in interpretation for that. Uh, next slide, slide, please. In the meantime, Rome statutes also allow judges to apply customary international law and also many other international principles, then how we can harmonize such a criminal approach, criminal law approach, and international law approach in terms of applicable law. Next slide, please. For you to understand that, I strongly recommend you to read this decision uh, from Untananda case in DR Congo situation regarding victims of war crimes of rape and sexual slavery. This is the decision regarding the scope of victims or definition of victims of war crime of rape and sexual slavery. This one, this decision is important uh, for you to read because this is regarded as one of the most important decision ever uh, of ICC history. But I recommend you to read this decision because you can, if you read the reasoning of this decision, you can find out easily how judges well harmonize the criminal law approach and international law approach <coughs> for the in interpretation of the Rome Statute, especially the defi definition of crime. <coughs> so I strongly recommend you to read this decision to raise your aw awareness about this applicable law issue and the way of interpretation of the Rome Statute. Next slide, please. And ICC as a whole, 
the whole organ of the ICC is well connected with electronic court system. So through this database of evidence database, victim database, and case law database, we can work without any paper. This is already completely paperless court. And all the submissions from parties and all the decisions of judges are also issued, presented through this e-court system. And all those public information in this e-court system is also shared with the public through our website. So I strongly recommend you to be familiar with, to be friendly with ICC website because you can find every information, necessary information, relevant information to study ICC. You can find everything in our website. So I strongly recommend you to be familiar with the ICC website uh, first, if you want to study more about the ICC. And next slide, please. And there are some lacunas. We have very good statute rules, regulations, but there are also Still, we have some lacunas, some empty places, which those are not covered, which are not covered, covered by those uh, applicable law. Uh, so that's why judges need to keep on developing practices on procedural matters. And judges always agree on the best practices on our procedural matters, and that is uh, published through this chamber's practice manual. So if you want to study the details, in the, uh, in the reality of the court work, how the judges are conducting procedures in the courtroom. Uh, you need to also need to read this chamber's practice manual and you can find this, this in our website as well. So that's why I already emphasized that to be, uh, to, to be friendly with our website so you can find any, pass, any uh, good information uh, for, for, for studying of the ICC. And next slide, please. An ICC court process is composed of three stages, pre-trial, trial, and appeal. And pre-trial, this is overlapping with the investigation, but investigation itself is totally, completely up to prosecution. Judges cannot intervene. Judges cannot control any of investigation by prosecution. But, but wrong statutes provide the judges, pre-trial judges, some role, some role during investigation. These are those rules of a pretrial judges during investigation. So before starts officially investigation at the ICC, prosecution spends some time for preliminary examination, preliminary examination. And if they have any questions during preliminary examinations regarding jurisdiction or admissibility, they may ask questions before pretrial chamber judges. Then pretrial chamber judges give answers to that and if there is appeal, then appeal chamber judges give final answers to that. So before we start the trial, the hearings, so though all those jurisdiction issue or the mission or the miscibility issue is completed by the pretrial chamber judges. And if there is appeal and appeal, appeal chamber judges. And if the investigation is satisfied with this jurisdiction or the miscibility, which includes both complementarity and gravity, and interest of justice, then prosecution start investigation officially. But when it comes to referral by state party or referral by Security Council uh, of the United Nations, uh, the investigation starts without any further uh, procedure. But when it comes to investigation on his own on initiative, or on his prosecutor's own in initiative, or proprio motu, uh, then Prosecution needs to ask pretrial chamber judges for authorization. So this authorization is one of the important role of pretrial chamber judges. And after investigation, they have enough evidence to arrest one individual and proceed to a specific case from situation. Then they also need to uh, request for arrest warrant before pretrial chamber judges. So these are a major role of pretrial chamber judges during investigation. Next slide, please. And if you want to study more about authorization process, authorization process uh, uh, in, uh, regarding the proprio motu investigation by prosecution, I strongly recommend you to read this decision, appeal chamber decision on, on 5 March 2020 uh, regarding 
authorization, investigation authorization uh, from Afghanistan situation. So this decision uh, clarifies the role of judges for authorization process. That appeal chamber separates the role of prosecution and role of judges in this decision. And you can find uh, such differences uh, of role of uh, two, two organs uh, for this, for at this authorization process. So I strongly recommend you to read this decision to enhance your understanding of authorization process. And uh, this, this display, uh, this, this presentation file, I personally made this, so I cannot share the whole file with you. But if you are interested in uh, specific, uh, some information in, in specific slide, feel free to capture or memo of, my, of, my, of, of the slide in my presentation file. Next slide, please. And if the suspect is arrested by arrest warrant, then <clears throat> confirmation hearing start by pretrial chamber judges. <clears throat> and then the prosecution needs to present document containing the charges as the outcome of their investigation. This is the final result of the investigation by prosecution, DCC, document containing the charges. But the charges in this document do not go directly before trial judges. Only confirmed charges by pretrial chamber judges, pretrial chamber judges are sent to before trial judges. Next slide, please. So the confirmation decision is a final authoritative document setting out the charges. So these charges, confirmed charges, is the maximum scope of a trial. Even trial judges cannot add new facts or circumstances beyond these confirmed charges. This is important for the protection of the accused person, right of the accused person uh, during the trial. Uh, next slide, please. So if you are interested in studying the confirmation process, I strongly recommend you to read this Ongen case confirmation decision from Uganda situation. Not only the contents, but also structure, a totally new structure uh, uh, compared to the previous confirmation decision, this decision is almost is, is quite well regarded as kind of template for the confirmation decision. So you can find everything regarding confirmation decision and also pretrial process and investigation process by reading this decision. So I strongly recommend you to read this decision by pretrial chamber two on 23 March 2016. You can find every things, every issues regarding confirmation process. Next slide, please. And those confirmed charges are sent to the sent to be for trial judges, and then trial chamber judges start the trial. But start, before start hearing of a witness testimony, they spend some time for trial preparation. Uh, during tri trial preparation, the prosecution present again the list of materials, evidential materials, including list of witnesses. And then we schedule all the witness testimony because usually we have very quite a big number of witnesses. Uh, so we need to uh, have, we need to develop, establish some tight schedule of the witness testimony. And after this preparation time, we start hearing of witness testimony. And so hearing is mainly for witness testimony. So testimony during the, uh, uh, during the hearing. And uh, all those materials submitted, submitted or presented during the trial are uh, used as evidence. And after evaluation of witness testimony and evidence, we can issue judgment, either conviction or acquittal. And if there is a conviction judgment, then we need to also issue sentence judgment and also reparations order. Uh, next slide, please. And I will tell you briefly how the admission process is taking place at the, at the SICC, because understanding <coughs> evidence is most important part for you to understand the court process. So first provision, you need, first article you need to know is regular, uh, Rome Statute 697, 697, which 
uh, rules that which provides that uh, any evidential material obtained by means of violation of this statute of international internationally recognized human rights cannot be admitted. Uh, but Rome Statute provides more requirements for this purpose. Uh, this is a little uh, high, higher threshold than the national system. But this kind of illegally uh, collected material cannot be used for evidence. This is uh, common throughout the whole system. Next slide, please. And when it comes to, do, uh, no, no, the previous one, please. When it comes to documentary evidence, uh, judges have more discretion, like the common civil law system. So we can uh, admit most of the documentary evidence based on these only three, uh, uh, three threshold, relevance, probative value, and praise, without prejudice to the accused person. We do not have any other evidence rules, such as hearsay rule, or chain of custody rule. Only these three uh, threshold for the admission of documentary evidence. Next slide, please. But when it comes to statement, uh, or any statement of witness or, or victims, that should be given in person before the judges or through video link. Video link is equal to the uh, testimony in person in the courtroom. That is requirement of Rome Statute. This is more like the common law system. And that's why we have always long list of witnesses who are uh, supposed to test, give testimony in the courtroom. But we have exception, that is rule 68, which allows judges to admit written statement, written statement produced by prosecution during investigation, instead of listening to the testimony of the witnesses in the courtroom. This is rule 68, which is exception to the statute 69.2. Next slide, please. So if you want to study more about the trial process at the ICC, I strongly recommend you to read this judgment of Untangada case in DR Congo situation, uh, which was delivered on 8 July, 2019 by trial chamber six. This was the biggest case ever until that time. Uh, and this is covering the most important crimes and charges of the Rome Statute. So if you read this decision, you can find most up-to-date jurisprudence of the court of all these major charges. Next slide, please. And this is also covering all those procedural matters and evidence or demission matters throughout the whole court process. So you can understand how fact finding is taking place and how the legal finding is taking place and how the evidence is evaluated by judges. You can find everything in this decision. So I strongly recommend you to read this decision to, en to enhance your understanding of the trial process at the ICC. Next slide, please. And if there is a conviction, the trial chamber judges need to deliver reparations order. Reparation is a very unique process at the ICC. In the national systems, this requires separate civil case before civil court, uh, civil case court. But at the ICC, this is part of crime, crime criminal procedure. And then the pretrial, the trial judges need to deliver a reparation order if there is a conviction of the accused person. So, and the, this requires a principle on reparations and reparations order. And appeal chamber always ruled that reparations order should cover these five elements, uh, convicted person, victims, harms, times and modalities of reparation and liability. The next slide, please. If you are interested in this reparations order, I strongly recommend you to read reparations order of Untangada case from DR Congo situation, which was delivered on 8 March 2021 by trial chamber six. This decision, this order has not been confirmed yet by appeal chamber, but I recommend you to read this because this decision, this order provides updated principles regarding reparations and also provide all those jurisprudence of appeal chamber 
regarding those five elements of for 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 reparations order. So you can read, you can understand all those necessary jurisprudence and the principles regarding reparations order by reading this this order. This is a very short order, but this comprise this includes every information regarding reparations order. So I don't recommend you to read the read the conclusion of this order, but all those reasonings in this order, you can understand easily and clearly all those jurisprudence and principles regarding reparations order. Next slide, please. And appeal chamber is not that different from a measurement system. So they review uh, all these conviction, sentence, and decisions of the trial chamber or pretrial chamber. And one of the important case I want to recommend you to read is this uh, factors to consider for release decision from Gvakpo case, uh, because uh, they usually the accused person is detained for a long period of time uh, during the whole trial process. So we need to keep on consider whether to release those accused person in the detention facility or not and what aspects needs to be discussed for that purpose. You can find the answers in this decision. Uh, ne next slide, please. And as my final aspect of lecture today, I'd like to briefly tell you about the exercise of a jurisdiction issue, which is most difficult and most controversial issue of the court. As I mentioned, uh, this is treaty body, which means we can, in principle, take care of only member state, state parties to the Rome Statute. And if, uh, so for, 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 the, for those state parties, uh, if there's a referral by a state or initiation by prosecution, then we can exercise jurisdiction over those state parties uh, without any problem. And precondition to exercise of jurisdiction is that crimes committed on the territory of the state party. You, you must remember this, on the territory of the state party or crimes committed via national or state party. But the important one is this on the territory of a state party uh, for, for, for my for following uh, lecture. So next slide, please. But exceptionally, if there is a referral by the UN Security Council, uh, by Rome Statute 13b, we can exercise our jurisdiction over non-state parties. This is the only exception we can exercise jurisdiction over non-state party. That is a Sudan situation and Libya situation. If you want to study about this legal issue arising from non-state party situation referred by UN Security Council, I strongly recommend you to read the decision, this non-compliance decision of the Sudan situation uh, delivered by pretrial chamber two on 6 July, 2017. Uh, this was also confirmed by appeal chamber. So you can find every answers regarding legal issue arising from this non-state non party situation referred to by security council. You can find every answers in this decision. So I strongly recommend you to read this, this decision if you study more about this non-state party situation referred to by Security Council. And those are only two, Sudan and Libya. Then you may soon have a question, why, how the uh, ICC can handle other non-state party issues, which is now you can easily see, see through the press release such as US, uh, Myanmar, Israel, and Russia. How these non-state parties ICC can tackle? How, on what ground can ICC can do that? You may soon have such question because those are also non-state parties, but most of the press releases are about those four non-state parties, not, not these two non-state parties referred by Security Council, but these four other situations, as non-state parties, uh, mostly can be seen in the press uh, nowadays. Next slide, please. So Myanmar is 
is is not our situation because Myanmar is not is not is non-state party, so we cannot exercise jurisdiction directly over Myanmar. But Myanmar is part of Bangladeshi situation. Bangladesh is our state 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 party, and Myanmar is tackled through this Bangladesh situation, and the pretrial chamber one uh, ruled that one element of a crime of deportation, element one element of a crime of deportation took place on the territory, as I said, on the territory of a state party, Bangladeshi. That's why we can exercise jurisdiction over Myanmar issue. That is the answer from the pretrial chamber colleagues. So as I said, we can exercise jurisdiction directly, non-state party without Security Council resolution. But if there is such connection with the state party, such as element of crime, of our crime, element of crime taking place on the territory of state party, then we can exercise jurisdiction uh, as part of a situation, a state party of non-state party. And Afghan situation, pre-trial chamber two, on 12 April 2019, uh, ruled that any uh, crime committed on the territory of a state party, uh, we can exercise jurisdiction irrespective of the nationality of the offender, irrespective of the nationality of the offender when it comes to any crime committed on the territory, on the territory of a state party. This is the link between the state party and non-state party, which allow ICC to exercise jurisdiction uh, over non-state party personnel. Next slide, please. And Palestine situation, the pretrial chamber rule one uh, ruled that thanks to the resolution, due to the resolution of the General Assembly of the UN, the Gaza and West Bank is territorial, is under the territorial jurisdiction of the Palestine. That's why, and Palestine is a state party. That's why we can exercise jurisdiction over, uh, over crimes committed on the territory of Gaza and West Bank. This is the, again, this is the link of state party and non-state party in this Palestine situation. So, right, but these are more about uh, these are mainly about opening investigation. Can we open investigation? The state parties, which is closely connected to non-state party. Can we do that? Pre-trial chambers answered yes. If there is any link, such link as I introduced between state party and non-state party, especially there's a link uh, in the, on the territory of a state party. That has been very strong uh, jurisprudence, decisions of pretrial chamber judges. But after investigation, uh, maybe there is maybe some arrest warrant of, of, of the national, of non-state party. And then case should proceed against non-state party national. Is this also possible at the Rome Statute regime? Because as you know, the, those non-state parties, US, Russia, Israel, Myanmar, keep on saying that without, without Security Council resolution, Security Council resolution, uh, the ICC cannot proceed to any specific case against non-state party national. That has always been the argue from those non-state parties, which is closely connected to state party situation. But can we do that? Can we proceed to issuing arrest warrant or specific case of a non-state party national from state party situation. Next slide, please. Just a couple of weeks ago, pre-trial chamber one on 27 January, 2016, answered yes. They ruled that the case against Mr. Mindezhaev, who is a Russian national believed to currently reside in Moscow, Russia, falls within the jurisdiction of the court. So not only 
investigation, but also a case after issuing arrest warrant, uh, we can exercise jurisdiction through this, uh, through this state party situation against any personal, national, or non-state party. This is most recent uh, answer from non-state party. But in this decision, uh, they, uh, the, the judges did not mention, they did not mention discussion, discuss about the relation between Article 13b, whether this requires the Secret Council resolution or not. They did not discuss that issue in this decision, but they just ruled that, the judges just ruled that the case against non-state party national from state party situation still under the jurisdiction of the court. This is answer from pretrial chamber judges. Uh, so this is, uh, this is what I prepared for the lecture today. And this, I believe this lecture today includes most important judgment decisions recently uh, give, uh, delivered by the judges at ICC. And the uh, uh, core procedure aspect of the court, I hope my lecture today may help you study and catch up, as I said, all the jurisprudence and the function of the ICC. For, for your future study uh, of the of, and then uh, for 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 the of the of the about the court. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Shash Chang. We also have an honor to have one more Asian judge from the ICC, Her Excellency Tomoko Akane. I have a privilege to invite Judge Akane for her short intervention. Judge Akane, the floor is yours. Thank you. Hyung um, Hyung Sung um, for your very kind introduction. Um, I'm very glad uh, to have many participants through this webinar. Uh, and uh, who are interested in the ICC. I am a judge from um, Japan and also um, belong to the pre-trial chamber now. Um, judge Chun is a senior uh, ICC judge to me and uh, I'm a next uh, Asian judge from Asia. But as already uh, President and Judge Chung explained fully, only two judges uh, out of 18 judges are Asian judges now. So um, I strongly recommend to your own country's judges or prosecutors to run for the uh, next ICC judges uh, election. Uh, I'd like to uh, increase the number of the uh, Asian and Pacific regions judges uh, to the ICC. And recently, uh, as you already know, uh, I, I, I was really delighted when um, Ms. Nazat Sham Khan was elected as a deputy prosecutor from Fiji. So this kind of uh, 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 this kind of things uh, will continue, and young people will uh, be joining uh, the ICC as many as possible. At this stage, I will not uh, uh, add more, but uh, during the answer and. Uh, question and answer session, I'd like to uh, intervene a little bit, uh, depending on the uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chosha Kane, for your valuable contribution. The students have been invited to uh, post questions, Your Honors. We have some very interesting and uh, thought-provoking questions from the floor. So if you allow me, I'd like to pose a few questions on behalf of the panels. 
um, starting off with the lighter uh, note uh, question. Uh, the question was posed uh, anonymously. Uh, this portion, uh, the question reads, how is the ICJ different from the ICC and what is the relationship between them? So, uh, so Jakani, do you want to answer this question or? <laughs> Maybe uh, you can do that. Okay, uh, I, will, I will do it briefly yeah. because yeah. ICC is a criminal court where uh, while the ICJ is not dealing with the criminal case directly, that is more about the state responsibility. So that is uh, kind of litigation between states regarding some responsibility of one state uh, by another state. So that is only the state can be the parties before the litigation uh, uh, for the litigation before ICJ, while the ICC is, is like the criminal court in the national system. So prosecution, the case is between prosecution and the accused person. So we are chasing individual, not state, individual for criminal responsibility, not any state responsibility, criminal responsibility, which is given in the Rome Statute only. So this is the basic difference between ICC and ICJ. But both are located in The Hague. This is the same aspect of these two courts. And ICC, ICC is, it, uh, as, I, as you may, I, I, the, the first slide of my IC, uh, the presentation today is the, uh, the photo of our ICC building, which is very much modern. And I, ICJ is very much, uh, very much uh, like the castle style court building. So the, we have such a difference as well, uh, but uh, both are located in, 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 the, in the Hague. And that's why the Hague is very much proud that this city is city of peace and justice because those two major international courts, ICC and ICJ, are both located in The Hague. Uh, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Shang. I'll straight uh, move on to the next question. It's posed by um, Youngjun Kang. Uh, the question reads, uh, compared with other criminal procedures, how the independence between prosecutors and judges is guaranteed although they are in the same organization. Yes, thank you for this important question. Always in independence, especially between prosecution, chamber, and defense lawyers. These are very important and most important aspect for criminal procedure. But sometimes uh, people have such questions because, uh, because this one court policy, everything is, is, in, is, is exists together on the one name of ICC, prosecution, uh, uh, chambers, and the defense lawyers as well. Uh, but, but as I said, prosecution, investigation, totally up to prosecution. And only those couple of roles are provided by the Rome Statute. So Rome Statute itself clearly provide, uh, divide and clearly provide such independence to the prosecution and to the defense lawyers. So that's why the judges uh, cannot intervene or control any part of their role. So it's clear from the Rome Statute. So there is any problem in reality regarding this independent role uh, between all these organs at the ICC. But all the administrative support, as I showed in my, in, in my present, this presentation, uh, electronic court systems such as electronic court, this is covering the whole court for the purpose of administration or administrative support. But when it comes to this judicial work, this is totally uh, separated independently through this uh, Rome Statute regime. And there isn't any uh, conflict or problem at all. Thank you very much for your kind answer, Chesheng. I'll uh, move on to the next question from the anonymous attendee. Um, does the ICC still have jurisprudence over a state leader from a country in which they had recently removed itself as a member state of the ICC? Uh, so, Jack, can I do you answer? Um, 
if if uh, I understand your question correctly, maybe uh, it is um, with regards to jurisdiction, jurisdiction. Uh, over a state uh, leader from a country in which had recently removed itself. Um, uh, I think um, it is, uh, for example, Philippines uh, situation. Uh, before uh, Philippine, uh, Philippines um, officially uh, withdrew uh, from the ICC system, uh, of course, uh, Philippines was a member of states. During that uh, uh, stage, if uh, some, something, uh, some crimes were committed, uh, under the jurisdiction of the court, uh, such um, period of the uh, period uh, could be uh, the target of the uh, ICC's investigation and also prosecution. So um, no uh, exclusion from the leader uh, if uh, the leader himself or herself is a, a criminal or suspect during that time, it would be uh, the uh, target of the investigation. That is what I wanted to uh, ask, answer. Thank you very much. Um, the next question was posed by Song Hee Kang. She starts by saying, thank you so much for your rich explanation all around the trial process. I am curious about who will be in charge of the execution process of reparations. The ICC staff take care of those processes, making sure the victims get reparations. And another question would be, what will be the most attractive points about young lawyers working at the ICC? I presume the second question could be addressed in the next session. So I'd like you to uh, highlight the first questions on the reparations process at the court, uh, yeah, to be answered by your honors. Thank you very much. As I mentioned, if there is a conviction, we should also issue reparations order for the victims. And reparation is, is carried out by, uh, by some, some uh, other organ at the ICC named Trust Fund for Victims. Trust Fund for Victims, TFV. They are in charge, that is in charge of exercising um, this reparation order. But not only TFV, but also uh, some important uh, sex section in the, in the res registry, such as VPRS, Victim Reparation, uh, Victim Participation Reparation section. They are also supporting a lot for the participation and rep reparation of the victims. So, both registry and TFV are working very closely and cooperate very closely to make to pr provide the best solutions for victim participation and also victim reparation. So not only the chambers, if you are interested in working for the ICC, I also strongly recommend you think about working for registry as well, because in the registry, you can find many such legal work or lawyer's role especially for the victims. So if you are interested in working for victims, think about such sections in the registry, also TFB for your future career. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much, Chang. If you allow me, I'll move on to the next questions. We have uh, very much uh, rich questions uh, posed by the attendees. So I'd like to... Uh, uh pose another one uh, by Risha Surya. Uh, the, the question reads, I want to ask about the legal issues happened in China, Palestine, and Russia. Can these countries be tried? And uh, can you pose some examples uh, what kind of um, punishment? It is a very generic question, but uh, we'll be grateful if you can address in a, in a, a generic note. Actually, I already um, gave some examples uh, you can consider to get, ans to get answers to these questions. As judge, we cannot give answer, uh, we cannot talk about an issue of a specific situation or specific case. So instead, I introduce you the recent decisions 
of my pretrial chamber colleagues regarding those non-state party related to, which is closely related to state party situation. So if you read those four decisions, which I already introduced during my lecture, you can, you can have your own answers regarding the possibility of those kind of non-state party issue, which is closely related to state party situation. So I hope this could be answer to your question. Thank you very much, Jia Xiang. We have uh, several more minutes to address uh, some of the questions uh, remaining in the floor. Um, the next one uh, is posed by the anonymous attendee. Uh, the question goes, uh, when a non-state party to the ICC makes a declaration to accept the ICC jurisdiction, can the state limit the scope of jurisdiction, for example, excluding the crime of genocide? If not, uh, what would be the statutory basis for the answer? So, do you want to answer this? Um, I, um, <clears throat> I, I couldn't find the question, but uh, non-state party uh, if uh, non-state party accepts uh, ICC jurisdiction, uh, that state cannot limit the scope of the jurisdiction by themselves. That is, uh, uh, the ICC uh, or prosecutor uh, of the ICC will see the situation and find, if they find the uh, crimes under the uh, jurisdiction of the ICC, they are entitled to investigate such kind of crimes. Thank you very much, Tasha Kane, for your kind um, answer. Um, if you allow me, I'll uh, have a um, few more questions for you to address from the floor. Um, it is also posed by anonymous attendee. How does the ICC enforce its efficiency considering efficacy and efficiency considering it cannot directly punish individuals. Do states government generally follow through the decisions made by the court? What measures are taken if the states governments do not take any actions? Right, so we have member states, 123 member states, and member states have an obligation, like other uh, international treaties, conventions, have a strong obligation to respect the provisions, articles in the Rome Statute. And the Rome Statute also provides that state party needs to follow all those uh, decisions uh, from, from the court. So that's why <clears throat> uh, we need uh, get cooperation, we can get cooperation from the state parties throughout the whole court process. And the state parties are supposed to uh, provide their cooperation as much as possible. That is the uh, system of Rome Statute system. And that is also same with all uh, with other international convention treaty system as well. So there's not that, not that difference as, uh, between Rome Statute and, and any other international convention or international treaty. So based on such cooperation and, <clears throat> and in obligation of member states, we can walk through uh, without any problem. That is the uh, system, uh, the Rome Statute regime. Thank you. Thank you very much for your answer. Um, I'll move on to the next question because we have uh, still a few more minutes. Um, it is about the substantive element of the, um, of the court's jurisdiction. Uh, the court's agenda on broadening its network towards the Asia Pacific region is quite commendable. My question is related to the court's efforts on the protection of cultural heritage during wartime around the world. What kind of issues does the court anticipate with protecting the cultural heritage in Asia and the Pacific as the least represented region? Would the Almaty decision facilitate the court's work on that? 
A deep thank you to the esteemed hosts and the panelists. Hmm. <laughs> okay, thank you again for this question. I, as I said, I cannot uh, answer to any specific situation of the country, but you already have answers in this question. So Almaty case is the best answer, best decision. You can find answers uh, regarding to your questions. So I recommend you to read this Almaty decision of judgment and also Almaty reparation of Israel if you are interested in protection of this cultural heritage uh, from these, uh, these crimes. Thank you very much, Jiaxiang. Um, I'll have uh, one or two more questions, if you allow me. Um, the next question is from uh, Mel Aquino. Um, the question reads, if an individual is found to be guilty of a heinous crime, where would he, she be incarcerated or in prison? The question goes, if an individual is found to be guilty of the crime, uh, where would he or she be imprisoned? Do you want to answer? Um, I cannot find. Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes. Ah, uh, I see. Um, <coughs> if if uh, he or she is convicted by the ICC, uh, the convicts uh, ex convicts will be imprisoned. Uh, under the uh, Rome Statute. Uh, so uh, basically uh, in some countries where uh, the agreement with the ICC uh, already uh, con uh, con uh, uh, contracted, for example, uh, some country uh, has uh, agreement to uh, execute the uh, imprisonment in that country, and also uh, the ex-convicts, uh, um, uh, if he or she agrees to be incarcerated or imprisoned in that country, uh, he or she will be imprisoned in that country. But if such country cannot be found by the ICC, or uh, if he or she does not agree, uh, usually uh, he or she will be incarcerated in the, uh, in, in, in the um, uh, penitentiary system in the Dutch, uh, in, in the Netherlands. Maybe um, uh, Christian Mar will uh, <laughs> answer the question better than I. Thank you very much, Chakane. The next, next question is uh, posed by Dr. Shanji Sharma. Uh, as, um, I'm very sorry. Um, uh, the question goes, uh, what issue do the ICC envision as being key issues facing Pacific Islands? And what advantage do Pacific Islands have in being parties to the Rome Statute? So I want to answer uh, this way because uh, Rome Statue is not, is not just uh, focusing on specific country or specific region. This is for the whole world. So you can see the value of the Rome Statute, uh, not just for specific country or region, for, for the whole world. Because as mentioned by president, this is the, the protect, protect all the people in the world who are supported by some, some big powers without any proper uh, judicial process. That is purpose of this court. So those countries who cannot provide on their own investigation trial for those big crimes, we do such role instead of those state parties. That's the idea of the Rome Statute and that's the role of the ICC basic role. So we call it 
fight against the impunity, fight against the impunity. So by joining the ICC or Rome Statute, you can, you can be the member of such an important role and function of the ICC. That is the pride as a member state of state parties, improving such a fight against impunity or improving so national systems in the future so that they can do that on their own in the future. That's the role of the ICC and that's the value of joining the ICC and Rome Statute. So I hope you understand that way. Thank you very much for your rich explanation, Coach Chang. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, a few moments uh, to address some of the more questions because we keep receiving very interesting questions and I'd like to um, take an advantage of that. Uh, the next question is posed by Catherine. And the question reads, the ICC operates on the principle of complementarity, which means that the ICC only take over the investigation and prosecution of a case if the state is unwilling or unable to do so themselves. What national states increasing, increasing abilities to prosecute their own cases, which presents several advantages to the national state, is there not a danger that the ICC will run out of work one day? <laughs> so sometimes I make a joke that ultimate goal of the ICC is to make the ICC closed. <laughs> As you mentioned in the question, if all the states in the world are well equipped to their own facility, capacity, to do own investigation and trial, we don't need ICC anymore. Actually, that could be the ultimate goal of ICC. But in the meantime, for the time being, we cannot, I cannot see such a thing may happen in the, uh, very soon. And that's why we, with ICC is necessary. And that's why we are working very hard at the, at, in The Hague uh, for all those cases and situations uh, in, in throughout the whole world. So for the time being, we may still have many work cases to do. And, but in the meantime, as I mentioned, in, in, in encouraging state parties or even non-member state parties to be well equipped with their own capacity to do investigation trial on their own. That is also important role of the ICC. We call it kind of a positive complementarity. Complementarity is not just limiting our jurisdiction, but also encouraging state parties to be well equipped with their own capacity. That is positive complementarity. So we will do both together so that in the meantime, we are doing our best to help those uh, countries who cannot do that on their own, but why we also encourage them to develop their own system or capacity to do that in the future. That's the role of the ICC at the moment. Thank you very much, uh, Shang and Jessicane. I think the last question uh, put us in a very uh, important position for the future of the ACC. Uh, now uh, we're uh, moving on to the next session. We are very sorry we cannot answer all questions, but we'll try to answer them to the possible extent uh, using the Q&A box for the remainder of the session. Now is uh, time to proceed with the second session of the event with a very exciting topic of a career in the field of international uh, criminal justice. I have the privilege to invite the moderator, Mr. Christian Marr, Director of Division of External Operations of the Registry of the ACC. Uh, he will preside over the session. Mr. Right, Mar? So, so, so sorry, but before, before start the session, so I now have to leave because I have a hearing from 9.30. So I thank you very much again for your attention and hope you enjoy the rest of this seminar, which would be very much useful for your study and for your future career. Thank you very much. I'm leaving now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chachu. Thank you, Chachu. Mr. Mar, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Hyun Sun. Uh, good morning to some of you and good afternoon uh, to the rest of you. Uh, my name is Christian Marr. Uh, as introduced, I'm the Director for External Operations, and I will also be your moderator for this next session, where we will speak. As the President mentioned, uh, we clearly have a dearth of uh, staff members from the Asia Pacific, uh, and we would like to convince you during this next session to 
seriously consider the ICC as a career prospect for you. So with that in mind, um, I would like to uh, uh, invite, uh, not immediately, but uh, very shortly, a number of panelists uh, from the court, uh, various parts of the court, who will be joining us to talk about their experience of what it's like uh, to uh, work for the court. Uh, our not so hidden agenda there is for you to, to from the standpoint of, of uh, Asia Pacific applicants, to get an idea of what it actually is like uh, to work for the court. Uh, but before we get to that point, I would like to touch upon a number of issues uh, to just lay the background for what the relationship is between the court and the Asia Pacific as far as states are concerned, and also the prospect of employment, how, how much or how little uh, Asian states are, are represented uh, in the court uh, as far as staff members are concerned. Now, uh, before I start my presentation on this, which will be relatively brief, I just want to put a bit of a caveat. After this session, there'll also be a subsequent session where we have a representative of our human resources section who will talk about more of the details of how to get a job at the court. Uh, so uh, in terms of the mechanics of getting employed, uh, working as an intern, that will be addressed at the session right after uh, the session we will have right now. But uh, what I will be focusing and what the panelists will be focusing is not really the mechanics of how to work for the court, but more of the what it's like uh, to work for the court. Uh, so uh, if you could just keep that in mind uh, in terms of, uh, particularly in terms of the questions you pose for this particular session. Um, so uh, with that in mind, uh, I'd like to start uh, my brief presentation to give you a little background. Could we start the, uh, the PowerPoint presentation, please? Thank you very much, Audrey. Can we go to the next slide? First of all, as I mentioned, I'd like to speak about uh, the relationship between the court and its Asia Pacific states. Uh, and you'll be hearing this word, uh, and you have been hearing this already, and you will hear this. When we refer to universality in the court, this is the idea of trying to have all of the states uh, of the world uh, become parties to the Rome Statute. So hence the, the universality of the Rome Statute. Could we go to the next slide, please? Now, uh, the Rome Statute has been in, in place um, as of next year. It'll be uh, 25 years. Uh, there are 123 states parties uh, to the Rome Statute. Now, if you look at uh, the membership of the UN, which is 193 states, you see that we have uh, a while to go. We have, in fact, 70 more states to be at a state where all the members of the UN are also parties to the Rome Statute. So this is indeed our roadmap. Uh, and and uh, uh, when we speak about universality, this is our, our biggest challenge. Next slide, please. The president already mentioned this uh, during his opening statement, but um, when you look at the Asia Pacific region, which is composed of 55 states parties, uh, we basically, uh, we have 19, member states. This is uh, uh, just about a third. It's a, a very low number compared to the rest of the world uh, in terms of their uh, participation in the Rome Statute. The majority of other regions are, well, I'll show you uh, very shortly, uh, but uh, the main point is that uh, the Asia Pacific as a whole is dramatically underrepresented uh, compared to the rest of the world. In fact, if you look at the number of uh, amongst these 19 you realize that over the last 11 years, since 2011, we've essentially only had two states, Palestine and Kiribati, who've joined us uh, during the course of the last 11 years, uh, which uh, does not bode well. And also within there, uh, Philippines has withdrawn. So in terms of the total numbers, we have not had a dramatic uh, improvement over the past seven years. Next slide, please. As I referred to this earlier, uh, really uh, uh, Asia Pacific stands out in terms of its low representation. 
uh, it's at 35 percent uh, in contrast to many of the other regions, which are at the very least 60 or above. So uh, there's a lot of catching up to do uh, in our uh, region. Um, next slide, please. Now, now that was uh, essentially what I uh, presented to you uh, earlier was the representation of Asian states uh, in the ICC in the Rome Statute. The next uh, briefing I'd like to provide you is how are Asian staff members reflected uh, within the ICC? Next slide, please. This is essentially uh, what you see here is a breakdown by region. Uh, and in terms of how many staff members there are over the targeted, uh, the ideal, this is very much done just as you do in the UN and other international organizations in terms of the contribution of the states in the region, the financial contribution they provide to the budget of the organization vis-a-vis -vis how many staff members they should ideally have. Now, looking at this, you ideally want the gap between the, the, the red and the blue here to be as small as possible. So taking uh, Eastern Europe as an example, this is sort of the ideal. You have a fairly close alignment between uh, the ideal number and the actual numbers. Uh, and you see here clearly, there's a huge gap uh, in terms of uh, Asian uh, participation uh, in the court. Uh, next slide, please. In terms of actual numbers, uh, when I talk about the, the gap between ideal and actual, uh, once again, uh, you see uh, the ideal uh, for Asia would be 18.3%, 34% of the entire population of the, the, the court staffing. Uh, the actual is 6.65. So the gap is 11.69. Uh, There's a very big spread uh, between what we should have and what we actually have. Uh, the short uh, wind of this is really that uh, uh, as a court, once again, if you're Asian, uh, there is a very strong desire on the part to attract you. Uh, as the president mentioned, uh, it's, it's very important from the court's perspective that uh, the, the, the population uh, of the court, the staffing of the court reflects the membership of the court. Otherwise, uh, you're seen as being uh, a court of, of one part of the world and not the global reach uh, that we, we really ought to be. Next slide, please. Uh, just to give you an idea, and uh, uh, Bruna, uh, subsequent to this, will later on uh, once again talk about the mechanics, talk about more of the details uh, in terms of what we're doing. But I just wanted to, to shed some light in terms of what efforts we are making to try to reach out to those of you in the Asia Pacific. Next slide, please. Over the past couple of years, we've been using, uh, particularly over the past year or two, uh, social media. We've uh, been using LinkedIn amongst others, Facebook as well, but particularly LinkedIn to try to uh, identify individuals who might be particularly suited for some of the vacancies that are coming up. Uh, and we've been actively, proactively reaching out to, to many of you. There are also opportunities to come on board as a visiting professional. Uh, this is for, uh, uh, not for, well, interns, of course, but these are for people who are mid-career, uh, who've had more of a, a work experience to join us uh, for a duration of time to get a feel for what it's like to work for the court. Junior professional officer, I'll leave it up to Bruna to give you the details, but this is a program available to nationals of, of certain countries where uh, you're essentially sponsored by your country for a two-year period as you work for the court. Uh, and this is one opportunity. And I think you'll be speaking to some uh, current or, or, or previous uh, JPOs when we have our panel as well. Uh, there are other pilot projects that have been put together to try to draw attention to the court. Uh, and uh, really just to flag that geographical representation when we uh, recruit for jobs is certainly uh, a very important element uh, taking into account in its totality when we recruit staff. Next slide, please. Amongst the 19 states, really uh, to flag here that uh, amongst the 19 states parties of Asian Pacific states parties of, of the ICC, the Rome Statute, uh, in fact, 10 are actually non-represented. We don't have a single staff member from these countries. And you'll see that to the left. Uh, and to the right, you'll see countries 
that are represented, but not sufficiently represented. Uh, and most remarkable uh, here, you'll see that Japan actually is the most underrepresented country uh, in the entire, not just Asia Pacific. Uh, there's uh, th minus 33. So this means that we need 33 more Japanese to be at parity, to be at the ideal number. And likewise, Korea at minus 12 is certainly one of the uh, clearly one of the most underrepresented states. So uh, amongst those of you attending today, I think there, there are a sizable number of you from Korea and Japan. Uh, this means that there's clearly an interest on our part uh, to try to bring you uh, on board. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, next slide, please. Just to really uh, give uh, you a reflection, I, I assume many of you are lawyers, you're interested in law, but uh, in terms of the representation of lawyers in the court, uh, it's uh, number 10 uh, in terms of the kinds of expertise we're looking for in the court. So of course we're looking for lawyers, but we're also looking for many other expertise like IT, language skills, uh, security, finance, human resources, programming, uh, uh, public information. So um, uh, most people who reach us tend to have this preconceived notion that we're only looking for lawyers, uh, just to really uh, re assure you that of course we're looking for lawyers, but there are many other professions that we're looking for. So um, if you have the opportunity, please keep that in mind and, and do spread the word. Um, and one last slide that I'd like to touch upon before going to the panelists. Next slide, please. Is really also uh, a lot of the interest in the court starts at the internship stage. We find that many people join us as interns. Of course, it's not a prerequisite, but it's a good chance to get to know the court. Um, we have uh, clearly, Asians are not that well represented amongst their internship. What you see there, uh, WIOG, it's Western Europe and others groups. So this is your, your North America, Australia, New Zealand, and Europe. Uh, they're very highly represented as interns, as staff members, uh, but uh, uh, we find that uh, there are very few Asian uh, uh, participants, uh, which also goes back to the fact that we have very few Asian applicants uh, for internship, for jobs uh, to, to begin with. Um, but for a lot of that, I will once again ask Bruna to uh, take on those tasks. So uh, without further ado, I'd like now like to, to move to the panel discussion. Uh, with that in mind, uh, if we could switch over to the other participants. Thank you. So it's my privilege uh, to uh, open up the floor for our panel discussion now. I think this is going to be a very interesting session. Uh, what we've done, as I mentioned earlier, is to bring on board three staff members from the court uh, who uh, um, have a, a very good idea of what it's like, uh, the experience of actually working for the court. So we'll ask them, uh, I will pose uh, 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 a question or two, uh, and we'll certainly take questions from the floor. So now is your chance to pose questions. Uh, to our, our staff members to uh, get a feel for what it's like and for them to share with us their experience uh, working for the court. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our three panelists. Our first panelist would be Jayon Kim. She's the Associate Legal Officer. She works for the chambers uh, in the court with the judges. Uh, the next panelist is Yumi Omiya. Uh, she's the Associate External Relations and Cooperation Officer, and she works for the Registry of the Court. Uh, and last but not least, we have Pupudu Sachitanandan, uh, who's our trial lawyer, uh, and he's with the Office of the Prosecutor. So we have three different staff members, three different countries in Asia, and three different organs of the court. So I'm certainly looking forward to a very interesting uh, dialogue uh, with them. So uh, as the moderator, I'd like to take the privilege of being the moderator and pose the very first question. Um, and um, I think we're all very curious as to uh, a number of things about our participants, but uh, I would very much like the first question to be an opportunity for our panelists to talk about their background, uh, what they do within the court, and the steps they've taken, what it, you know, their, their, their road to the court, how did they, they find themselves 
uh, in the court. So for this, I'd like to allow a bit more because it's quite a, an open-ended and quite an extensive question. So at the very least, please, each of you spend uh, four minutes, uh, three, four minutes to cover these areas. So really your background, your role within the court and your path uh, that has led you to the court. So I'll start with the same order uh, for this question in which I introduced uh, the uh, panelists. So uh, Jayon, uh, would you like to kick it off, please? Um, thank you for the introduction, Christian. Um, my name is Jayon Kim. I'm currently working as an associate legal officer at the ICC. Um, well, to um, say a little bit about me, um, I did my bachelor's in law in Korea, and I also did my double major at English language and literature. And I studied in the US for my LLM degree. And I'm also currently working on my PhD in law at Seoul National University. Um, I, before coming here, I worked at the Supreme Court of Korea and National Court Administration for four years. So I had a legal background in education and I've always wanted to work in the ICC. It was my dream to work here. And somehow I was looking for um, international organizations and the, the ICC JPO position has opened up. And that is the junior professional officer program, which I think the Bruna will be talking about later in the session. So I applied for it and luckily I have gotten the position and I currently work at the trial division at the chambers. So what I do mostly is I provide legal support to the judges. So I help in doing legal research and help in preparing legal documents and decisions and judgments. So for me, I have more chance to engage with the judges in the ICC. So I find it very, um, it was very eye-opening and it's, there are so many things to learn. And I have colleagues who are from all over the country. So it's always very interesting to come to the office. And I, I think it's, it, for me, I think it has been a very positive experience. Um, I started working here this February, so it has been five months, so I'm still quite new and I'm still learning, but for me, I think it's been very, I'm, I'm very happy to be here and working here and I find the work very interesting and people are very um, open and approachable, so I I highly encourage other people and especially from um, Asian countries to apply for the ICC because as you have seen from the Christian's um, presentation, there are not many Asians working here. So I hope that there will be more. And I really think there are a lot of talented people who are very afraid of um, like even you know applying for this jobs because it was same for me because this is my first time working in an international organization and I was to be quite frankly honest I was kind of scared of just applying for it because I didn't know if I will be qualified but I think many people are qualified and they're just scared and it's it's a new experience so um, what I would recommend is, I think, you know, it's better to do things and, and like as fast as possible. And I think if you just, you know, it's what can go wrong, you know, it, it's, it's a very good opportunity to work. And there are a lot of interns and VPs, and I would highly, you know, encourage other people to apply for it. And I believe there is a, currently an open position for a JPO program from Korea. So I, yeah, I hope that, you know, the participants here today will, you know, will see how good it will be working here. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jayon. Uh, I now like to give the floor to Yumi uh, to address the same questions. Over to you. Thank you very much, Christian, and hello, everyone. My name is Yumi Omiya. I am from Japan. Uh, just to briefly explain my background, I studied criminal law in my bachelor degree in Japan. And then I went to the law school in the US and I studied international law, especially international human rights law, international humanitarian law, so mainly the international public law. Uh, after that, I did internship at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan 
Uh, to be exact, I was working for the permanent mission of Japan to the United Nations. And after that, I worked for the law firm, the private law firm. And then uh, in 2018, uh, in 2017, sorry, I applied for the JPO program, the same program as Jayo mentioned just now. And then I started working at ICC in 2018. Um, the law I do here at the court is uh, that I'm mainly in charge of the judicial corporation. So my day-to-day -day work includes uh, analyzing the cases and drafting the judicial corporation requests and sending them to the relevant state authorities. And I also do uh, external relations work uh, to maintain a good relationship with the United Nations or other international organizations and the state authorities and other stakeholders such as universities or civil societies. So organizing this event today is part of my work and I hope it helps promoting the understanding of the ICC. Uh, the road to the court, uh, as I briefly mentioned, um, because I have the background of uh, studying criminal law and international law, so naturally, I was very interested in international criminal law, and it has been my dream to work for the ICC. So what I did first, like when I graduated from the law school, is that applying like every possible internship opportunities. At that time, I didn't, uh, I wasn't successful, so I didn't get any internships <laughs> at the ICC. I also applied for the staff positions at the ICC. Uh, but at that time, I didn't have any experience, so I could not get any positions at that time. Uh, and that's why I uh, did a different internship at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan. And then uh, after working for the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Japan and a uh, private law firm, I kept applying for the ICC positions. And one day I found the JPO announcement in uh, Japanese Morphers website. And I was really happy because I thought like that would be a very good chance for a Japanese national to uh, apply to the court. So I took advantage of the JPO program and I got accepted in uh, 2017. I started working in uh, following year 2018. So that's uh, how I ended up here. And uh, as Jayan uh, already mentioned, uh, it's been quite a, a rewarding experience to work for the court. Um, and I think the chances are for everyone and like uh, we would like to work on more Asian uh, colleagues or interns at the court. So I hope uh, today's event serves uh, for those who are interested in uh, the work at the ICC or the internship at the ICC. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jimmy. And thank you for that uh, theme of uh, never give up and keep trying uh, for the court. Uh, that's uh, that's actually, uh, absolutely valid. Thank you very much. Uh, over to you, Pupudu. Thanks, Christian. Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, yes, so, we can. so my <laughs> perfect. My name is Pupudu Sachitanandan, um, and perhaps this is one of the few communities where my surname will not be impossible to pronounce. Um, um, I'm a trial lawyer at the ICC uh, for the Office of the Prosecutor, which usually means that I uh, represent the Office of the Prosecutor in the courtroom. Um, make submissions before the chambers, uh, examine witnesses. Um, and in fact, that's one of the reasons I have to leave at 10 past nine today because I have to be in a courtroom. Um, uh, and at other stages of cases, I uh, provide uh, advice and input into investigations uh, and also draft documents such as uh, applications for arrest warrants, documents containing charges, uh, et cetera. Um, in, I'm, I'm from Sri Lanka and I grew up in Sri Lanka, um, uh, which may be a useful perspective because it's a, a, a non-state party actually. So you can come from a non-state party and also work at the ICC, it's a possibility. Um, I also did my initial legal education in Sri Lanka at Sri Lanka Law College, um, and then um, did uh, postgraduate study in, in, uh, in, in the United Kingdom. So I have... Um, a, uh, one master's in public international law and a different master's in uh, international human rights law. Um, and even though uh, those degrees were not directly connected to criminal law, both actually came, became, were very useful uh, for my later work uh, as a prosecutor at the ICC. 
Um, in terms of career path, um, I, I did uh, some professional work in Sri Lanka. Um, and um, I also uh, worked for some time at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, which was set up to investigate the, uh, the genocide that took place in Rwanda, uh, as well as uh, another international investigative NGO. Um, but I sp I've spent a large part of my career at the ICC, in fact, um, close upon 15, 16 years, perhaps. Um, and um, I, I started initially uh, working in the legal advisory section, uh, providing legal advice as a, uh, within an independent section within the office, uh, but then moved on to uh, a number of trial teams, the trial teams relating to Uganda, uh, Darfur, uh, Central African Republic, um, uh, the Congo, et cetera, uh, and um, spent much of my time in, in trial teams, except for a few, a few years working for the appeals section, uh, which is a section which litigates appeals within the office of the prosecutor. Um, and it has, um, as Christian mentioned, it has been a bit of a lonely time as an Asian in the office of the prosecutor because we don't have many of those. Uh, we don't have many Asians. Um, uh, and I've often had conversations with uh, people in Sri Lanka, in India, in China, in um, uh, Korea, for example, as to why this is. And one of the problems, as far as I understand, is the lack of profile. It's, it's simply not talked about in law schools uh, sufficiently uh, or, or in junior career events sufficiently in Asia that this is a viable career path. Uh, and, and, and maybe this um, gathering is, is a good opportunity to make ambassadors for the ICC. Uh, you, you know, uh, and if you are organizing um, career discussions in your own universities, career discussions in your own law firms or any other uh, field that you're working in, um, I think it would be very valuable to mention uh, the ICC as, as, a, as a good place to work, as an interesting place to work. And um, certainly as someone who has worked here for a long time, I can confirm that it is a fascinating and very rewarding uh, career path where you can work with people from many different backgrounds. I'll stop there for now. Thank you very much, uh, Pubudu. Um, I will, I started uh, scanning the questions. I realized that quite a few of them are for you, Bruna. Uh, so I will, you know, the, the how, the, the, the logistics of that, I will ask uh, you to handle it. So uh, what I've taken uh, the liberty of identifying questions that have already been posed that might be of, of direct relevance uh, to this panel uh, for the moment. So, uh, and in doing so, if you could uh, forgive me for paraphrasing some of these questions. There was one that, that came up earlier and I, I'd like to sort of uh, add a, a, an additional element to it as well. But the question really was about uh, what is the most attractive uh, aspect of, of working uh, for the court. Uh, and likewise, I want to throw in there my own, what are also the challenges of, of, of working for the court? I'd like to give you, you know, uh, uh, at maximum two minutes or so, really just the first uh, idea that comes to mind in terms of what is the most attractive aspect, uh, one or two aspects, and what is what are the mo more challenging aspects of indeed uh, working for the court? So perhaps we'll go in reverse order. Uh, Pubudu, uh, would you like to uh, kick this one off? Um, sure, Christian. Um, I would say the aspect I enjoy most about working here is diversity. Uh, in, in terms of people, um, I, 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 can't, I can think of very few places in the world where you get to uh, have lunch with people from 10 different countries and work on a daily basis. Um, I work with people from Egypt, from Italy, from uh, the United States, from uh, Libya, from a whole bunch of countries. Uh, and I find that very uh, invigorating. And I also find that it broadens my own thinking and challenges my own preconceptions. Um, one of the, challenge, the most difficult parts uh, of working here, unfortunately, it also relates to diversity in that we, are of, we come from different legal backgrounds as well. So, um, uh, and cultural backgrounds, and sometimes um, uh, communicating uh, or, or reconciling our own uh, training, for example, from a particular legal background with uh, training uh, of another person from another legal background can be uh, challenging as well. Uh, but, but I have to say that the, the, the pro of diversity far outweighs the con of diversity. Thank you, Pupudu. Uh, I'll go to you, uh, Yumi. Thank you, Christian. 
Um, there are many fascinating things about the court. Um, if I would uh, raise one example, I think uh, the, I enjoyed uh, the work, which is very dynamic uh, and rewarding because you can actually feel like your day-to-day -day work contributes to, the, um, to bring the justice to the world, uh, if I may say. Um, because the work you do relates to the cases that like reported in the newspapers and the media and ICC deals with uh, quite a big scale cases. So it's very uh, fascinating that you're part of it and like you're contributing with, to it. And as people already mentioned, the diversity is also very attractive. I had a have a chance to work with uh, many people from the different backgrounds. It could be a challenge as people mentioned because uh, everybody's coming from different legal background and you know, generally in a different background and like everybody has a different um, way of thinking, but uh, it's, all, uh, it's a challenge to um, understand like uh, your colleagues in the in perfect tree, but then uh, I think I enjoy this process a lot and that allowed me to grow like professionally. Uh, so that's a very attractive part of working for the court. And personally, because I studied criminal law and criminal procedure law and international law, um, I think I'm very lucky that like I can uh, use my knowledge and what I learned at the school directly to my work. And this uh, allows me to grow as well, like in terms of um, the knowledge about the uh, subject that, that I'm truly interested in. So uh, those things are very attractive things about working for the court. When it comes to challenge, uh, for my uh, uh, responsibility, I think it, because it includes a wide range of subjects, uh, I do both uh, judicial work and also the diplomatic work. So for the judicial corporations, it's very legal and judicial. So my legal background is quite useful there to analyze the cases and like uh, grasp the uh, fact, like what happened in this case. And then you need to identify what kind of corporations are needed and you would uh, need to find a way like how best it could be achieved. And uh, you need to draft a very accurate uh, judicial document, which is a corporation request. And then like you need to transmit that to the state authorities. So here the diplomacy kicks in and like you have to be a diplomat of the court to present the request uh, in a very efficient way to the state or so, uh, state representatives. So uh, it involves a lot of different um, aspects. And sometimes I'm a diplomat, sometimes I'm, I'm a lawyer. And if I event uh, organize this kind of event, I'm the event organizer too. So uh, juggling these like different uh, type of work is uh, often challenging, but I really enjoy it. And this actually uh, presents that like the court has uh, the staff from uh, with a different uh, expertise and it's not only for the lawyers. So I hope like this could be understood as a positive aspect of the court as well. Thank you. Thank you, Yumi. Uh, over to you, Jayo. Um, thank you. Um, I think I will have to repeat what Pupudu and Yumi had said, but I find that the people here are really, truly amazing. And I think it's because it's such a diverse place to work. And I think it's, I think it's mostly in Korea, it's kind of hard. It's not a good thing to stand out. But here, because it's everyone is different, like you have to stand out because you're from a different country and you have different values and cultural system. So it's very, you know, everyone, it's the basis is that everyone is different and they are all have different ways to contribute to the system. And so I find that they're very um, an attractive part of working in the ICC. And um, one of the challenges that I have is because I work in the chambers and there are a lot of evidences and statements that are written in French. So um, I am not very fluent in French, but um, I think I have to learn French more. But I think if you are working here, I think because the French and English are the working languages, I think it would be very beneficial if you speak two languages. So that's um, all I have to add. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jayon. Uh, you just uh, touched upon the next question I was going to ask you uh, that we have from the from the pan, uh, from the participants, which is that of the role of the French language, because 
I also get asked this very frequently to say, well, a lot of the, the vacancy announcements indicate that it's desirable to be able to speak French. Uh, do you find uh, how, what is your relationship with the French language? What sort of a, is it a hindrance, uh, the fact that if you don't speak it as much or is it an advantage if you do speak it? Uh, if you can just give me uh, your experience. Uh, maybe, Joanne, since you, you, you opened up that subject, if you can dwell upon that, that just a little bit, and I'll open it up to the other panelists uh, uh, in terms of your relationship with, with, with French and the impact it has on your work. Thank you. Um, I think because um, there are a lot of hearings that are done in French, and, but I think it's not a required element it's probably desirable because there are a lot of um, interpreters and translators who translate French to English and vice versa. So I think if you speak in fluent in one language, it, it will be sufficient. But if you have knowledge for both languages, it will be very efficient because you don't need to read the translations where you don't have to listen to the interpretation. You can just listen and understand right away. So I think I find it very beneficial if you know the two languages and fluent in it. But I, 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 so it's, yeah, it's beneficial, but it's, I don't think it's required. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that, that uh, in terms of the impact it has on, on your, uh, your role within the court. Uh, uh, Pupudu, Yumi, uh, would you like to chime in? Are there any particular observations you have? Uh, sure. Um, I, I, I do. Um, I didn't study French uh, when I was a, a kid in school uh, because in Sri Lanka you, uh, you I didn't have that option, um, and I and I did find that uh, challenging when I worked on uh, because I I had to study French in my twenties uh, and my thirties, um, um, and uh, what I realized is as you grow older it's it's a little more challenging to learn languages you know so so if you are um, uh, let's say in your teens or in your twenties I would say now is the time. To, to really invest in your language capacity. So if you have the opportunity of taking a French course, I would really encourage you to take it. Um, I think that it is useful at the ICC because of course, a number of ICC cases are in French uh, and a number of your colleagues, if you work here, will speak French. So that, I think that will be a very useful tool. Having said that, the fact that you don't speak French is not a deal breaker. So please don't consider it a barrier um, for applying, for example. So, so I would say that. Uh, I would I'd also add that uh, speaking uh, other languages such as Arabic would be very helpful, uh, as well as uh, perhaps uh, Spanish, for example. Thank you. Pupudu, uh, Yumi. Thank you. Uh, I'm very glad like you posed this question because uh, it's, uh, I think, the concern for many of the Asian uh, uh, applicants. Uh, when I applied for the internship or job at ICC, I was quite uh, worried that like the fact that I don't speak French, uh, but I'm here. So like I got accepted without the knowledge of French. So I want to emphasize that like the French is always like a uh, uh, useful but like it's not the uh, requirement so if you speak one of the lang working language English and French uh, for example the English then like uh, you have a chance to work for the ICC just speaking of myself like when I joined the ICC I had zero knowledge of French so I quickly started learning French after I joined the ICC and I'm I have to say I'm still learning, but uh, it's a great uh, place to learn French as well. My supervisor is French. I have many uh, French colleagues um, and uh, you have many opportunities to learn it. Um, and uh, as Pupudu said, any other language is useful. Like I thought when I joined the Aishishi, I thought like Japanese, the language is not so useful, but I have a chance to uh, write email in Japanese to, for example, the authorities of Japan. So any language is very useful. And uh, I want to just uh, for, uh, highlight that like the French is useful, but like it's not uh, absolutely required uh, to apply for the positions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Yumi. Uh, this leaves us with about two minutes left. So I'm, I'm going to pose a very quick question for, for the three of you. Uh, and this is a question we get asked quite frequently. What's it like uh, living in The Hague? Just, uh, you know, a, a minute uh, each. Maybe I'll start with you, Yumi. Thank you, Christian. Uh, what it is like to live in The Hague? Uh, 
It's a very peaceful and calm and charming place to live in. I love The Hague very much. The first uh, week I arrived here, I found it very quiet because I used to live in New York, Tokyo. But then The uh, Hague is such a uh, lovely city, like it's a capital of the international law. So it's so easy to make connection with the, in the, uh, the people in the same field. We have the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Uh, also some other international organizations as well. And the, the fact that city is compact actually works positively in this sense to uh, meet with people and connect with the people. So I love uh, living in, in The Hague and I love traveling in Europe. So I don't see any downside to live in The Hague. Thank you. Thank you, Yumi. Uh, I'll go to you, uh, Jayon. Well, I heard that Korea is very hot right now. So for in the weather in The Hague, it's quite nice. It's quite mild. So there are no dramatic like um, summer and winter as in Korea. So I find it very comforting. And there are a lot of parks that you can just walk to. So I think it's the greenery and everything. It's and The Hague is quite a small city in my, like a person from Seoul. So you can find everything very conveniently. So I find it, it's a very good place to live. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if you could wrap it up, uh, uh, Pupudu, over to you. Yes, I'll, I'll, I'll support my colleagues. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting mixture of a town and a village. It's the size of a big village but it has all the amenities of a big town. So it's an, so, so I would, um, so, and it's, the Hague is based near a beach. The ICC is near a beach. The ICC is actually in a dune, which I think is fascinating. So uh, I, I, I think that you, that you could have a, a very good life here. Uh, and my colleagues who have children also say that um, it's a great town to bring up kids in. So, so on that side, I would say uh, two thumbs up. <laughs> All right, I'll end there, Christian. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pupudu. Thank you to, to, to all my panelists. I, I, I thought it was quite interesting that none of you brought up the food, but anyway, we'll leave that for another day. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Pupudu, Jayon, uh, and Yumi. Uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, contributing to this panel. Uh, this concludes our, our uh, panel session, and uh, I think uh, it's over to you, Bruna, for uh, many of the, uh, the practical questions. Thank you again to our panelists and thanks for the questions posed by the participants. I'll hand the floor back. Thank you. Yeah, we continue on the topic of jobs and internships at the ACC. Uh, as uh, Mr. Marr has just mentioned, we have prepared a short presentation prepared by the human resources Action. Uh, Ms. Bruna Hofferman is here with us today. Thank you, Kim. Um, can you hear me well? Oh, perfect. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. I would like to thank you for the invitation. And as Christian said, uh, you heard about the experience of working at the ICC and uh, as part of the human resources section, I'm here to explain how you can get to the ICC and how you can contribute to justice. So Kim, um, could you maybe display the presentation, please? Thank you very much. So the title of the presentation is Working for Justice. And, and I think that uh, as some of the panelists have already mentioned, one of the great things about working for the court is knowing that you're working for a great cause. So uh, I'm particularly proud of working for the ACC and I think it's one of the greatest things of working at this organization. So can we move to the next slide, please? Yeah, so here's a, a few information that you may not know about the court. So the court has um, a bit more than 900 staff members and people from over 100 nationalities. So as um, my colleagues have already mentioned, it's a very international place to work. And uh, this is also part of the great experience of working for the court. So we have um, our headquarters based in The Hague. 
a great place to live, um, as it was just discussed. But we also have some country offices and we have uh, opportunities uh, to work in the field as well. Um, we have two working languages, uh, English and French, uh, but speaking one of them is already sufficient for most positions. Um, in any case, I'll go back to this point later. So let's move to the next slide. Um, I saw a lot of interesting questions in the chat box, um, and I think some of them will already be answered uh, through my presentation. And one of the questions was, um, do I need to be a lawyer to work at the ICC? And of course, we are a tribunal. So the positions available are mainly legal, but we do offer a lot of other positions. Um, as you can see in this slide, we have the positions divided throughout the court. So in the office of the prosecutor, the judiciary, where we have the chambers and presidency and the registry. The registry is like the secretariat of the court and is the biggest employer of the court. So in order to give support to the court activities, we need people with different backgrounds. So as you can see in the second uh, chart here in this slide, we do have a lot of legal positions, but a lot of other positions in other fields as well. So we have uh, positions in the field of administration, security, language, just to, to name a few. Yes, we can move to the next slide, please. Um, working at the ICC as a staff member, and some people ask what staff member really mean. So staff member is not, uh, it doesn't include interns and visiting professionals, but does include JPOs, so junior professional officers. And working at the ICC as a professional, um, you are exposed to this international environment that we talked about, but also you, are, you, you receive a very good compensation package based in the UN system. So we follow the UN common system um, for health insurance. You have an international health insurance. You also are a member of the UN Joint uh, Staff Pension Fund. And uh, at the ICC, one of the nice things is that we really focus on staff well-being and work-life balance. So you do have access to flexible working arrangements. So you can work from home a few days a week. Um, you can also uh, work a bit longer every nine days uh, and take the 10th day off. You also have parental leave, just to name a few of these uh, features of working at a place that really um, focus on well-being. Next slide, please. But how to get to the ICC? So uh, you might be asking, it's not so easy to directly land a staff position. So um, we see that the best way to get into the organization is through the internship and visiting professional program, and also the JPO, the junior professional officer program, as you've seen my colleagues discussing a bit before me. Um, so I'm gonna explain a little bit about these two programs. And if you still have questions, I can reply during the question and answer um, session afterwards. So let's move to the next slide. So the internship and visiting professional program is a big program of the court. So my team is actually managing this program and we do receive over 200 participants every year. So if you think that the court has 900 staff members or a bit more, and you have 200 interns and visiting professionals every year, you see that your chances of getting to a um, internship and visiting professional position are much higher than lending directly a, a staff position. So what are interns and what are visiting professionals? Christian has already uh, briefly explained, but interns, um, we are focusing on uh, people who are just finishing their studies or um, have limited work experience. So you cannot have more than three years of relevant work experience if you want to be an intern at the court. So you need to be in the final years of your bachelor's degree or further in your career. Visiting professionals, uh, they are a bit different. We are focusing more on experienced professionals. So you need to have at least three years of relevant work experience and already a first level degree, so a bachelor's degree. 
both positions, uh, internships and visiting professional positions, they are full time. And the duration is between three months and six months for internships, but visiting professionals can be a bit shorter. So it's between one month and six months. Let's move to the next slide. So um, I also receive a lot of questions regarding uh, who can apply for internship and uh, visiting professional positions. So positions, as Pubudu said, uh, similar to staff, are open to nationals of all countries, including um, non-state parties. And the positions are advertised throughout the year. So if you look today, you're going to see different positions advertised on the website. And if you look in one month, there will be new positions. So we don't have cycles of recruitment. We don't recruit only once or twice a year. So there are positions always being advertised on the website. Also, what you will see is that different from some other international organizations, we do have vacancy announcements for specific positions. So you're not going to apply for a generic internship at the court. So when you look at our website, you're going to see that there is an internship position for the finance section or for the country analysis unit. So and then you see everything you require for that specific position and then you can make your choice. Um, also, one other thing that people ask, can I apply to more than one position? And you can, it's not a problem. Uh, if you see that more than one internship fits your uh, skills and interests, I would invite you to apply. This will increase your chances of being selected. Um, internships at the ICC are mainly unfunded, uh, but we do have two uh, funding uh, possibilities. They are still limited, but we do have them. One is the trust fund for interns and visiting professionals from developing countries. We currently have seven positions uh, funded, advertised on the website. And to be eligible for this funding, you need to be from a developing country that are a state party. Uh, for visiting professional, there is also the EC grant, so the European Commission grant that funds uh, eight visiting professionals every year. So these positions will be advertised in the coming days. So I would invite you to keep an eye on our website and LinkedIn uh, that all the positions will, will be advertised in, there in the next few days. Let's move to the next slide, please. The other program uh, that was very mentioned during this uh, forum was the Junior Professional Officer or JPO program. So uh, Christian already briefly explained as well, but I'll explain a bit more in detail. So the JPO program is started at the UN and it's a huge program in there. At the court, it was introduced very recently and is based on bilateral agreements between the ICC and donor countries. So for now, we have six donor countries, um, Japan, Korea, Switzerland, Germany, France, and Finland. And these countries, they recruit JPOs on a rolling basis. And uh, JPOs, they are recruited as staff members. So they are at the professional level, they are funded, they have all the entitlements of any staff members. Um, one of the features of the JPO program, since it's a junior professional officer program, um, the applicants cannot be older than 32 years of age when applying, so at the time of the recruitment. And JPOs are usually from, don from the nationalities of the donor countries, but some countries are open to fund uh, people from developing countries. For now, we still don't have any volunteers, but we are working on negotiating agreements with states that are open to this possibility. So the duration of a JPO position is between one and three years, depending on the country. There are a few countries like Korea that only authorizes two years, but most of the countries are open to the third year as well. So this is about the JPO. And as Jayan said, there is a JPO position advertised on the website. Uh, is associate trial lawyer to work as Pubudu uh, in the office of the prosecutor. So if you have the Korean nationality, you have experience in, in law and uh, legal procedures, I would invite you to apply. So uh, let's move to the next slide. Um, a question that I receive a lot as well is how to apply. 
uh, the court doesn't receive any CVs by email or post, so please don't send us your CV. Uh, we have a platform, an online platform that you can go to and apply for positions. So this is what it looks like when you go to our website. And there you can filter the positions if you're looking for internships, visiting professionals or professional positions. You can find everything in there. Next slide, please. And uh, I've seen a lot of questions in the chat box um, about what do I need to apply to a certain position. So everything you need to apply will be mentioned in the job description. Um, so when you look at the website and you see a position, you click on it, and this is what it's going to open. This is what we call a vacancy announcement. And there you have the explanation where the position is, um, what are the duties and responsibilities, but also all the required qualifications. So regarding education, uh, professional experience and languages. So if you're not sure um, if you can apply, you don't have French, but you would like to apply for a position, go to this vacancy announcement and read the requirements. There we'll mention if French is really desirable or mandatory. Um, you're gonna see if you need a, a degree or another type of degree. So this, I, um, I would really recommend that you check the vacancy announcement because it's different for every position that you apply. So if you're applying for an internship in human resources, for example, we don't need you to have a legal degree. But of course, if you're applying to chambers, then you will need a legal degree. So the vacancy announcement will mention all that. Next slide, please. Um, another very important point, as I said, uh, internships, visiting professionals and staff positions in general are open to nationals of all countries. However, uh, the court is uh, need, in, in need to uh, improve geographical representation of some nationalities. So um, we do give preference when recruiting people from uh, state parties first, and then we look at uh, nationalities that are under or non represented at the court staff. And uh, here in this slide, you see the four uh, biggest underrepresented countries at the court. So you have Japan, as Christian said, Korea, uh, Germany, and Brazil. So people from these nationalities are highly recommended <laughs> or encouraged to apply. So, uh, but we have a full list and a lot of countries from Asia Pacific are in there. You can see on our website, the full list. And uh, as Christian said, it, it is a big uh, priority for us to improve geographical representation. So we really expect to receive your application in the coming months. Um, another point very important for the court is gender balance. So the court also gives priority to applications from female candidates especially for senior positions. Uh, I think, next, next slide, please. So um, all the positions that we have the court, we have positions being uh, advertised every week. So if you follow us on LinkedIn, you can receive these positions in your feed and you can um, be involved in what is happening at the court and you can apply to positions that interest you. So I would invite you to follow us on social media we also have a Twitter and a Facebook account, if you prefer. Um, and all the positions are also advertised on the website. So that's it. Um, the next slide has uh, our email address in case you want to contact us or if you have questions later, you can always get in touch with us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Bruna, for a very informative uh, session. I'm sure many of the participants found it very, very helpful. Uh, we have some questions followed by your presentation in the Q&A box. So in fact, a lot of questions. So if you don't mind, I'll pick a few uh, prioritized questions for you to address. Uh, I'll go off with um, uh, posing a question related to the JPO program. Um, uh, what happens after JPO program end? Uh, are these opportunities for the JPOs to stay at the ICC for the same or different positions? And I have another uh, related uh, question. I know that applicants who are over 32 are not qualified. I have about six years of work experience. Are there other aging workers in the ICC who are not recruited as a JPO program? 
Thank you, Kim. So about the first question, um, yes, the JPO, um, what happens when it ends? So the JPOs are here for a period from one to three years and they acquire a lot of experience. They are, uh, of course, welcome to apply to positions since their first day at the court. So they can apply for staff positions um, since the beginning. Of course, uh, after two years, they are much more prepared and much more competitive to uh, land a position at the court. So uh, the idea is that we prepare JPOs uh, for them to apply for positions inside the International Criminal Court, but also in the UN system and the national system. So the idea is that when they uh, have acquired this experience, they are good candidates for positions inside the court and outside. So that's what we see. We see that a lot of JPOs apply for positions at the court and they stay. But this is not the main uh, aim of the program. It's also to, to, it's mainly to develop these professionals so they can go and work outside court or inside the court, of course. Um, about the second questions. Uh, yes, uh, we do have Asia Pacific uh, nationals working, um, not as JPOs or judges. Um, Pubudu is an example. Uh, but we do have a lot of others. So if you don't meet the requirements for a JPO uh, position, you can always apply for staff positions as well or for a visiting professional if you would like to have more chances to get into the organization, know the organization a bit better and make, uh, make up your mind if you want to apply for a professional position in the future. I think, yeah, that's it. Thank you, Bruna. I'll move on to the next question right away. Uh, is it, uh, it's about the remote working environment. Can, um, well, the question starts saying, can graduating college students apply for an internship at the SEC? Is it offered via online or should it be uh, conducted via face-to-face? -face? Yes, thank you for the question. Um, yes. Since uh, the situation in the Netherlands uh, regarding the pandemic has stabilized, uh, we have come back to the building and we are fully working from, uh, from the office, except if you have flexible working arrangements and the, then you can work a few days from home. But internships are in person. Uh, regarding the degree uh, and the uh, academic background of this uh, person, a uh, bachelor's degree, uh, or if you're in the last year of a bachelor's degree or further, you can already apply for an internship. So um, I saw a few questions of people thinking that you need to have an advanced degree uh, or master's degree to apply for internships. You don't need that. So um, only for visiting professionals, you need to have completed your first level degree, so your bachelor's degree. Thank you, Verna. Uh, since you mentioned uh, visiting professional program uh, briefly, I'll uh, pose you uh, one relevant questions. Are the visiting professional program paid? And do they have an advantage in getting staff positions after their on end? Yeah, so visiting professionals are mainly unfunded. But um, as I mentioned, we're gonna have eight positions funded by the European Commission grant this year. So the positions will be advertised probably already next week. So, uh, and this is a great opportunity for you to come to the court and contribute to the mandate. So the requirement to get this funding, you need to be from a situation country, a country under preliminary examination or a country that is a developing country and state party. Uh, and preference is given to under and non-represented countries. So if you meet this criteria, I would invite you to apply. Uh, regarding um, the, the, the benefits of getting, of, uh, getting a staff position after you've done a visiting professional, um, this is the same as for an internship. Uh, you're going to be working at the court, you're going to be like, exposed to the work, to the uh, methods that we use, and of course, when applying for a position in the future, you're going to have more chances than an outsider, uh, but this um, doesn't guarantee anything, uh, there is no uh, expectations regarding uh, employment after the visiting professional position, but you do have an advantage if you already work for the court. Thank you very much, Bruna. 
Uh, I'll move on to the questions uh, relating to um, work experience. The first question reads, uh, do you have to have three years of experience in the same organization or can it be uh, from multiple organizations? And another one goes uh, by saying um, whether the JPO position uh, requires uh, requiring some years of work experience. I wonder if there's absolutely no possibility for those who have less experience with, than required to get the position at the ICC. Yes, thank you. Uh, for the first question, um, regarding, I imagine uh, the person is mentioning the visiting professional program that you need at least three years of relevant work experience. The relevant work experience doesn't need to be in the same position or the same organization. You can have different uh, um, positions in different organizations and in total have three years or more of professional experience. Uh, regarding uh, the JPO, the JPOs, uh, they are recruited at the P2 level. This is uh, the UN classification of posts. It's an entry level uh, position. So if you have a master's degree, you only need two years of professional experience. But in case you have just a bachelor's, you need four years. Um, and this is a, a strict requirement. We cannot really recruit people who don't meet this, um, this criteria. Thank you, Verna. Uh, one uh, very much related question before I move on to the next theme. Uh, for any legal related positions, uh, is it required to have a legal degree such as JD or LLB, LLM, or are other degrees such as human rights or international affairs that are relevant to the international law can be accepted um, as well? Yeah, thank you for, for this question. Yes, um, so as I mentioned, it really depends on the position that you are applying and the vacancy announcement. So the job description will mention which uh, degrees are accepted or not for that specific position. So uh, that would be my answer because it really depends on the position that you are applying to. Thank you, uh, Bruna. Um, the next question, uh, I may uh, pose it to the panelists of the uh, sessions uh, because we still have the uh, presence of two panelists here with us. Um, uh, uh, how long did it take for you to uh, receive an answer uh, through the recruitment process? Uh, maybe I can answer that question. I think uh, it depends on the case by case basis. But uh, when I applied for the internship uh, job a uh, long year ago, uh, I heard back after quite a long time. Uh, for the JPO program, I applied through the Japanese government and then that uh, response was quite fast. Uh, I think it normally takes uh, six months or longer, uh, correct me if I'm along Aruna, but uh, because like we, there are actually she receives a lot of applications. I think it takes time to examine all of the applications. So it takes uh, a, a bit longer than maybe like you expect, but uh, uh, I will leave it to Bruna to correct me if I'm along. Thank you. Yes, uh, so regarding the timeline of recruitment, it really depends as Yumi said, for JPO positions, it's usually much faster. It can be completed within six months. Uh, but for staff positions, uh, if you apply for a short term, it can be faster. But for a position that is established, so a longer contract, it can take up to two years. So um, we apologize for that, but we do receive a big amount of applications and we need to screen them all. So it can take time. Thank you, Bruna and Yumi. Um, there's one question regarding the process uh, of the uh, internship. Uh, what happens when someone is selected to be an intern or a visiting professional? Uh, is, there an, is there an exam or interview after the application? Yes, yeah, so for internships and visiting professionals, we usually have an interview. Um, and that's, that's it. If the person is successful, uh, they uh, can come to the court. Of course, first we have a security vetting procedure and then you receive an offer. But for staff 
positions for those who are asking uh, the same question for staff positions. We do have two types of assessment. So normally we have a written assessment first and then only the successful candidates are invited to the interview stage. So that would be my answer. Thank you, Bruna. Uh, I have a few more minutes to pose uh, one or two more questions. Um, this is not strictly uh, related to the uh, jobs and internship position, but there's one uh, question uh, posed to Mr. Christian Marr. Uh, I'm, I'm sure uh, Mr. Marr has mentioned it already, but uh, since it's an important uh, question, I'd like the opportunity to pose it once again. Um, is the ICC also encouraging non-member states national from the Asia Pacific region to apply for the ICC in an effort to encourage their respective non-member state to become members of the Rome Statute? Um, thank you very much. Um, we, we have been conducting a number of activities to try to encourage the number of states parties, but um, in terms of um, uh, recruitment, strictly speaking on that basis, there's a clear priority for states parties. So in a way, the ideal formulation, if you are from a non-state party from Asia Pacific to enter the court, is ideally for your country to become a state party and then for you to apply. It doesn't preclude you from applying to the court, but in terms of the, the prioritization, uh, as mentioned by Bruna, as well, there's a very clear priority for member states, and particularly if you are under, un, uh, or unrepresented. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Um, we are very sorry again, uh, having um, very, very much uh, interesting uh, questions, but uh, not being able to address them all. But we'll uh, try to do so by uh, recording all these uh, questions and answer them later. Um, we have almost uh, come to an end of today's uh, event. Uh, we have um, uh, closing remarks from Her Excellency, um, Deputy Prosecutor Nazas Shamim Khan. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Deputy Prosecutor Khan was not able to join us here uh, live today, but I have the honor to share with you her recorded uh, closing remarks. So uh, let's watch the video. In the traditional greeting of Fiji, Bulavinaka. It is a pleasure to speak at the closing of this forum, organized jointly by the court and the Hague Project Peace and Justice. I apologize that I could not be with you in person. And this is particularly because this issue of greater Asia Pacific representation at the ICC is one which is especially close to my heart. The Asia Pacific region is the most underrepresented region in the International Criminal Court. Only 34% of the countries in our region are state parties of the ICC. And the consequence, as you have heard, of underratification is the gap that is created in legal protections of the people of the region in relation to genocide, in relation to crimes against humanity, in relations to war crimes and the crime of aggression. But it also means that our perspectives of justice are not reflected on the development of international criminal justice. And in particular, our perspectives of justice are not reflected in the jurisprudence of the court. I am aware that the Asia Pacific Forum was created in 2018 to examine the reasons for this and to try to achieve a better representation in discussions on international criminal justice. And this conversation necessarily explores the reasons for hesitation, the way in which we can promote a greater relevance of the concept of international criminal justice to the region, and then ways in which we can institutionalize our efforts. But let me first deal with the documented reasons for hesitation. First, the sovereignty argument. I have heard from many countries in my region that it is a matter of state sovereignty that there should be complete reliance on the judicial and legal institutions of the state and that any acceptance of the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court undermines state sovereignty. 
Let me say this about this argument, that it was precisely this sensitivity, the sensitivity that states must be given space to rely on their own judicial institutions and to try individuals of crimes of atrocity within the, the domestic jurisdictions, it was precisely this sensitivity that led to the principle of complementarity. The principle is that the ICC is a court of last resort and that before the court has jurisdiction, it must first ascertain that the crimes concerned are not able to be tried within a domestic jurisdiction or that a state is not willing to try these particular offences within the jurisdiction of the domestic courts. And this process of complementarity is one that takes considerable time and effort, not only in the court itself, but by the office of the prosecutor. And it is for this reason that the outreach activities of the office of the prosecutor take up so much of our time. We must be sure that when the court exercises jurisdiction, that it does so because the domestic courts are not able or willing to try the same offences. And connected to that, therefore, is the interest of the court in the building of national judicial, judicial institutions. The work that we do at domestic level with judiciaries, the work of the Asia Pacific Forum, in fact, in helping domestic jurisdictions to work on the strengthening of judicial institutions. This is all consistent with the principle of complementarity, which is said to be one of the backbones of the Rome Statute. Another argument I've heard against ratification of the Rome Statute in the Asia Pacific region is that the court promotes Western values of justice, that it fails to reflect cultural diversity or cultural values in relation to what justice is. We know that the International Criminal Court is based on universal values, values of humanity's aspirations towards peace, security and justice. And in any event, we all need to join a community of nations to ensure that the values of the ICC include our perspectives the perspectives of Asia in the Pacific region. We cannot expect the court to reflect our perspectives if we do not join that community of nations. I have seen in my own work with multilateralism how the conversation internationally changes when Asia and the Pacific are at the table and helping to drive and to formulate the discussion. The way in which, for instance, discussions around climate change have really penetrated multilateral institutions all over the world, including WHO, the Human Rights Council, is, I think, an example of how the conversation changes when we are at the table. But we cannot expect the perspectives of the Pacific region or the Asian region to be included in the considerations of the court if we are not at the table. So that is a very powerful argument to join the conversation. Another example I've seen is when developing countries say that there is not enough consideration of economic, social and cultural rights in human rights conversations and how much that conversation has changed since more and more developing countries and Asia Pacific countries have joined the conversation at the council. So there is a very strong argument for Asia Pacific countries to join the family of Rome Statute ratified countries in order to help to change this perspective that the International Criminal Court only protects values which are somehow very restricted and from a Western perspective. Another advantage that I have seen when countries have joined the Rome Statute and have considered promoting individuals to join the International Criminal Court is that they, of course, have an advantage in recruitment policies. And in some cases, eligibility depends on a person being a state coming from a state party. So these are really important arguments in favor of greater ratification in the Asia Pacific region. 
The whole issue of complementarity, which I've already dealt with, is also extremely important because this requires a scrutiny of ourselves, of the way in which our own national systems are able to deal with crimes of atrocity. And of course, very importantly, and I keep saying this repeatedly, the International Criminal Court is not intended to usurp domestic jurisdiction. It is ultimately a court of last resort and it is based on respect for domestic jurisdictions. Let me turn to an argument that I have heard in my own region, the Pacific region, and that is that the International Criminal Court is not really relevant to the region, that it is isolated, that it is very far removed, that very few people from the Pacific have had any interaction with the court, and that therefore it has limited relevance to the region. I would say that there is one very powerful argument on the relevance issue. And that is that the court has the greatest emphasis on victim protection than any other court, certainly in the domestic sphere. The idea of giving victims the right to participate in court proceedings, the idea of creating a process for claiming reparations, the creation of the trust fund for victims, the work together for stronger national systems of justice based on victim representation, legislative frameworks, again, protecting victims. This is all innovative and it's new and it's victim-based. And in this sense, arguably, this is substantive justice at work. There is plenty of room for the, for the jurisdictions of the Pacific region and of the Asian region to work with the court to strengthen their own judicial systems, thereby making the court extremely relevant in our region. In addition to that, work with the ICC means that there is often available technical assistance for capacity building, and in turn, the ability for us all to help to shape not only international law, but domestic law so that to ensure that it reflects the way that international justice concepts have developed. And then, of course, importantly, when you are a Rome Statute member, then you have a right to nominate your own judges and officials as members of the court or the office of the prosecutor. And there are considerable professional opportunities for both lawyers and investigators within national systems to work at the International Criminal Court, often as experts or consultants, but in many cases as staff members of the International Criminal Court. And of course, if I may for one moment talk about myself, my own experience in the last few months of working as Deputy Prosecutor of the Office of the Prosecutor of the Court has been a great privilege. I feel greatly honoured, not only because it is a wonderful achievement for myself and my own career, but it is a wonderful achievement for my country and for my region. I feel when I come to the court every day that somehow the Pacific has arrived at the court and it's a matter of great pride. So I would anticipate that more and more applicants from the Pacific region will apply for positions and I think that they create professional opportunities for all of us, for lawyers, for investigators, for analysts, for interpreters, to work at the ICC and thereby help to develop their own career paths. Very importantly, ratification of the Rome Statute sends a message to all potential perpetrators of crimes of atrocity that they will be accountable, either domestically or at the ICC. It's an important message which has moral relevance. That is, that if you commit the most serious crimes against humanity, that you will be held accountable, either here in our country or at the ICC. One of the most important messages that we can imagine. So what's the way forward? I would say that a meeting like this one, a forum like this one, which focuses on representatives of states in the Asia Pacific region, on professions in the domestic criminal justice systems, and on facilitating technical assistance to those states which have ratified and now wish to implement legislative change, 
is a very important step and I congratulate the organizers of it. Care and focused work on achieving geographical representation at the ICC organs also seeks to counter the argument that the court promotes values from only one part of the world. And lastly, I would suggest as a way forward for those who do work for the ICC, that they must take on the role of becoming advocates in our own region to speak about our own experiences and to encourage others to apply. So in conclusion, I congratulate the International Criminal Court for its 20th anniversary. I am proud to be such a part of such an institution and I thank you very much indeed. I thank Deputy Prosecutor Khan for her very inspirational and powerful speech. Dear participants, we have now come to an end of the event. On behalf of the organizers, I'd like to express my deep appreciation to all participants and uh, the speakers for your contributions. I really appreciate your active participation and we are very grateful for the interest and support in general. Uh, before closing, I'd like to uh, share one kind reminder. A uh, short poll will appear on the screen shortly, uh, which will ask you uh, on your opinion about the overall event. We would appreciate if you uh, take a few moments to answer those anonymous questions. The uh, Force Asia Pacific Forum is now closed. Thank you once again, and I hope you have a pleasant rest of the day.